your opening comments. All right, thank you, and good morning, everyone. Glad to have this opportunity to speak to you today. Been the commander of the United States Air Force's Central Command and the Combined Force Air Component for almost two months now, and there's been uh, no shortage of activity over here, that's for sure. This battle space is becoming increasingly more complex and active by the day. Whether that involves safety of flight issues, cross-border operations, or targeting challenges, our team is getting it done. We are using air power to better understand and get after threats in the region, particularly DASH and other terrorist elements. In Afghanistan, precision airstrikes continue to enable the success of government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan counterinsurgency and U.S. operations across Afghanistan, as well as providing protection for ground forces. Resolute support continues to train, advise, and assist the Afghan government as they take the lead for security in Afghanistan. The Afghan A-29 combat operations began in April, and they have now flown almost 700 missions. As I look across the AOR, we continue to deliver air power, develop relationships, and ensure that we are defending the region. All of this is enabled by talented and highly dedicated coalition warriors. Recognizing the importance of the coalition, I've already met with counterparts in seven countries. Those include Qatar, Jordan, Turkey, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Kuwait to better understand the complexities of the battle space and explore ways to best leverage their capabilities. Beyond the increasingly complex air and battle space of OAR, there's a lot going on across the U.S. Central Command region. A recent activity that we are working is the possible establishment of a joint integration center with the Russians. The first step is a cessation of hostilities for seven days. And this is something the Russians and the regime must do, and they must do it properly. The intelligence community will continue to monitor the cessation and ensure that we are developing throughout this processes to execute the mission. That is if we get that far. Again, the cessation of hostilities for seven days will be key. We are in close coordination with U.S. Central Command, CJTFOIR, and our fellow components to work the details. As I mentioned, the battle space is very complex, so my intent is to not make it more complex, but this will take some work. As the terms of reference are finalized, We'll take that guidance, review it, and build an operational plan that executes the mission precisely, minimizing risk to the coalition team and civilians on the ground. We are still early in the process, but we'll work through the specifics and assess our resources to be able to execute in accordance with the agreement. Our intent is to ensure we don't impact coalition cohesion, our current momentum, or the precision effects that we demand. We're still working the details, but those are areas that will be addressed. While well, I'm prepared to answer questions about activity across the area of responsibility, I'd like to center today's remarks on what I'm seeing related to OIR and some of the unique things we're doing to dismantle DASH and help accelerate the liberation of Mosul and Raqqa. We should not underestimate what air power can accomplish with our partners against a threat like DASH. My intention is to continue to apply persistent pressure against this enemy and to exhaust their capability to function, sustain operations across the area of operations, and impact their ability to project influence beyond the region. This means actively getting after their revenue streams and severing their ability to sustain their terrorist fighters by using a full array of our capabilities. As we challenge this enemy in several areas, we are also maintaining strong linkages with the intelligence community to improve our ability to deliberately target DASH Discovering, analyzing, and destroying DASH targets remains critically important to our success. Although it is a complex battle space environment, I'll remind you that this remains the most precise air campaign in history. Our coalition includes various countries and multiple entities operating on land, sea, airspace, and cyberspace domains, and all recognize that DASH is an enemy that hides behind the civilian populace. My focus remains on creating an insurmountably tough and complex set of problems for DASH across Iraq and Syria. 
We will continue to shape the battle space, going after their revenue streams, killing their leaders, and creating organizational dysfunction. We will seek to use the weight of air power to remove Dash's legitimacy, shatter their vision, enable, and enable taking back the territory and resources they have stolen. We will also look to supply forces on the ground. We're using rapid global mobility to provide delivery on demand. And Jeff, if you can, can you please roll the clip? This clip is from a recent airdrop delivering an assortment of supplies in northern Iraq. For operational security reasons, I won't go into detail concerning who these supplies were delivered to or their contents. But this demonstrates another way air power is be being used to respond and adapt faster than the adversary to appropriately supply our partners on the ground in this important effort. Further, we are saturating the battle space with ISR, particularly in the areas of Mosul and Raqqa getting real-time visibility and awareness to the right people. Coalition air power continues to impact Daesh's ability to fight and conduct operations in Iraq and Syria. The second clip I'd like to show, and Jeff, if you could please roll that clip now, demonstrates a strike we just executed the other night at a Daesh headquarters also used to, uh, as a weapons production facility. The strike included yet U.S. F-15Es, A-10s, B-52s, F-16s, and Marine Corps F-18Bs that destroyed more than 50 points of interest, removing a significant chemical threat to innocent Iraqis. Intelligence had indicated that Daesh converted a pharmaceutical plant complex into a chemical weapons production capability. This represents just another example of Dash blatant disregard for international law and norms. The enemy is using innocent civilians as shields against our values and respect for human life. Dash fled Mambage, hiding among the civilian populace. This war requires increased persistence and the ability to remain vigilant in efforts to capitalize on Dash's tactical errors as we have done with several of the recent large oil tanker strikes and a large VBID production facility in Mosul. Last week alone, we destroyed more than 110 oil tanker trucks. In September, coalition aircraft of Zoffels have destroyed 42 tanker trucks in the vicinity of Raqqa. A great amount of progress has been made and we are maintaining momentum, but there is still a tough fight ahead against an adaptive enemy that will try to challenge us as we hone in on Mosul and Raqqa. Using the complement of air power available to us, we will continue to deliver more destruction to Daesh's command and control than they can absorb. We have gathered lessons from Manbij and will leverage them in coordination with our partnered ground forces to allow us to remove tools of terror from the battlefield. As we discover new or evolving DASH capabilities, such as small unmanned aerial systems, you can be sure we'll take it off the battlefield. We will continue to work closely with our coalition partners to prepare the battle space, ensure we're pursuing opportunities, and ultimately prevailing. And with that, Jeff, I'm ready to take any questions. Bob Burns from the Associated Press. Thank you, uh, General. Uh, in your opening comments, when you referred to the possible establishment of what I think you call a joint interaction center with Russia uh, on Syria, you said you wanted to be sure that it didn't uh, uh, harm co uh, coalition cohesion. I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that point about uh, protecting coalition cohesion. And also, could you comment on the reports that two U.S. Navy uh, surveillance aircraft were threatened by Iran over the weekend while flying near the Iranian coast? Uh, yes, sir. Thanks for that question. So, uh, with respect to the JIC, as I said, the first uh, point here is to ensure that the cessation of hostilities are accomplished and that the, uh, the Russians and the regime do the right thing over the course of the now uh, six days uh, remaining. Uh, meanwhile, our job is to ensure that we maintain our coalition momentum and continue to execute the uh, uh, attacks on ISIL, maintain pressure on Daesh, and ensure that uh, uh, as the coalition continues to operate together, that we maintain our cohesion. Uh, with respect to your second question, uh, I would tell you that uh, from 
where we uh, sit here at, uh, at LUD, uh, that has uh, been a continuing issue with respect to uh, Iranian intercepts. And uh, while we continue that, the specifics would be better directed to NAVSENT and to work with them to uh, uh, directly understand the specifics of those activities. Uh, next to Barbara Starr from CNN. Um, sir, I want to follow up on both points. More broadly than the Navy incident with the Iranians, what are you yourself, your command, specifically seeing in the way of Iranian activity against U.S. aircraft and coalition aircraft? What concerns do you have about it? And to follow up on Bob's other question, I'm still not sure I understand what you mean by cohesion. So let me ask, how critical is it for you to see uh, a promise by the Russians and the regime to move to precision guided munitions to avoid their possibility of striking civilians given the fact they don't use precision munitions right now? Yes, ma'am. On the, uh, the first question with respect to the Iranians, clearly we are always uh, monitoring uh, Iranian activity. And uh, frankly, in res with respect to our operations in OIR, uh, we've had no interactions with them that have, have led us in OIR to have any issues with our ability to execute our operations to continue to pr prosecute the fight against Daesh. We will, though, continue to monitor activity and work closely with our NASM partners to uh, report any activity that would be uh, provocative or not in accordance with the norms that we operate on a daily basis in the Arabian Gulf. Concerning the, uh, the Russians and, uh, and use of specific weapons, anybody that we work with, as you know, uh, we take great uh, lengths to ensure, number the one, that as we develop our targets, we clearly understand that, understand what we're targeting so as to be able to protect civilians. Um, as you know, this has been the most precise um, fight that we've had in history. And we have been able to deliver weapons with precision since the beginning of this, of this war. And we will continue to do that. And anybody that we work with will ensure that they have the capability to precisely understand what the target is, what weapons they're using, and ensure that uh, the, uh, the weapons are delivered uh, with proportionality on military appropriate targets. Um, that's the way we operate and we'll continue to operate. And we do that today with our coalition partners uh, taking great lengths to understand that uh, we know what the target is, where the civilians are, and mitigating any possible risk to them. Captain, can I just follow up very quickly? Sir, I, I still don't understand what you're saying. So number one, are you going to require the Russians and the regime to use precision guided munitions as a condition of you working with them? And on Iran, uh, I don't hear you saying that they're posing a threat in the Gulf. Is Iran posing a threat to aviation in the Gulf? Well, let me get back to the first question. And uh, we are still very early in the process when it comes to uh, the agreement with the Russians. And I think the important key to remember right now is uh, we will continue to do prudent planning with respect to uh, any implementation. But the reality is we have to get through six more days of the Russians and the regime doing the right thing. And uh, that's what we will continue to uh, work ourselves towards with respect to our processes uh, going forward. With respect to Iran, uh, that again is uh, an area where, as I said, we continue to monitor all the activity in the Gulf. Uh, the, uh, their actions with respect to uh, nascent entities and airplanes uh, maneuvering, we expect them to adhere to the professional norms of intercepts that we operate under every day in the Arabian Gulf and in international waters. Next, we've got a David Martin from CBS. I'd like to try the, uh, the coalition cohesion uh, question one other way. How would integrated airstrikes with Russia damage, or how could it damage coalition <clears throat> cohesion? And second, 
Um, you say you're doing the, uh, the planning now. Uh, is the planning being done in such a way so that if there is reduced violence for the next, for seven days on day eight, the U.S. is ready to conduct integrated airstrikes with Russia? So let me answer the first question again, and maybe I can clar clarify a little bit for you. On, on the coalition cohesion, what I'm specifically talking about is our ability to ensure that we can continue to maintain the momentum we've uh, been able to gather against Daesh. Um, as you all know, we have been able to really pressurize them and uh, force them to uh, come up with different tactics and uh, adapt to uh, the pressure that we put on them over the last uh, uh, several months. And I think that's a, an opportunity that we will continue to, to leverage with our coalition partners. So as we uh, look forward, should the cessation of hostilities hold, and I say that's, uh, again, uh, Im important that we all understand that the Russians and the regime have to do the right thing. Right now, we're doing prudent planning to think through what that would take. And uh, I think it would be very premature to, for me to get into any details on uh, what those specifics are, because we've got to work our way through that, and we've got to get through these first uh, seven days of cessation. Uh, so that, that's the approach we're taking. I think that's the prudent way from a, a military per perspective to uh, approach uh, this problem set. And uh, right now we're waiting for those, uh, the next six days of uh, cessations to occur. Would you be ready to implement the plan on day eight? Well, that's going to depend on what the plan ends up being. And so, uh, like I said, uh, we're working through uh, that. And, uh, and I think, uh, again, it'd be premature to say we're going to jump right into it. And uh, I'm not saying yes or no. Uh, I'm saying we've got work to do to understand what that plan is going to look like. Uh, next to Carla Babb with Voice of America. Uh, thanks for doing this, General. I have two questions. The first on the cessation of hostilities. How confident are you that Russia and the regime are going to hold this cessation? Yes, ma'am. Well, I think the uh, uh, the international or the I'm sorry, the intelligence community uh, will be monitoring this, and and I'll leave it to uh, them to. Uh, sort through uh, the details of how the cessation works. And quite frankly, it'd, it'd be inappropriate for me to speculate on, on how the Russians will react. What I would say is uh, for us to move forward, they and the regime are going to need to do the right thing to make sure we can get through these seven days. And then going more broadly on um, the air power over Syria and Iraq, there have been generals in the past that have testified on the Hill about shortages that the Air Force has seen, particularly with um, ISR drone pilots and also with some fighter pilots. Um, what are you working with here? Do you feel like you have a shortage of pilots? Do you feel like you have enough resources? Give us a picture. Yes, ma'am. And thanks for that. that. That's a great question. So um, what I would tell you is uh, from, from where I sit, I am constantly reviewing our resources, whether it be ISR, strike platforms, tankers, people to anticipate um, the operational environment and what requirements uh, we might have. Uh, clearly, ISR is always a challenge. Uh, what I would tell you is I am consistently impressed by what our co coalition warriors are able to do with the assets that we have. Um, is it a uh, a constant effort, yes, it takes work every day, and uh, we've got uh, airmen from across the coalition that come together to solve this problem, and um, it's, it's one that we work on a daily basis. Um, what I would also tell you is uh, we're getting the job done right now. I think uh, the results prove that we've been able to gain and mo maintain momentum, and I see that into the future. Now, what I would also tell you is if, if I have to make a call back to the services asking for more support, whether it be people, uh, weapons, or uh, specific platforms, I have no doubt in my mind they're going to deliver. Um, with the expansion into Libya, how much has that affected the resources you have? From my perspective, we've been able to work through that. Uh, you'll have to get to UCOM uh, and, and let them dive into the specifics from uh, uh, the absent um, perspective here, we've been able to execute everything we've been asked of, 
And uh, like I said, we've come up with some creative ways to uh, leverage the capabilities that we have in theater now to get the job done. Okay, next to uh, Carlo Munoz with the Washington Times. Hey, sir, a quick question. Um, first, an update kind of shifting uh, gears to Iraq. Uh, what is the current status of the upgrades being conducted at the air base in Giara, and how soon could uh, U.S. or coalition attack aircraft, uh, fixed wing, be able to uh, start carrying out missions from that base? Well, I won't get into the operational specifics, but I will tell you there's been great progress um, out there, and uh, it's continuing every day, and uh, it's, again, this is a partnered effort. This is uh, something we're working uh, from both the land component perspective with the Iraqis and uh, clearly uh, ensuring that as we begin to put uh, some of our airplanes in there in the, in the future that it's got the capabilities that we need. Um, I don't want to get into the, the, the operational details, but I will tell you that uh, we'll make sure it's ready and when the, uh, um, the ISF is ready to move out in their operations uh, to get after Missoula, we'll be prepared to support that and the, and the airfield to be ready. And a quick question on um, uh, civilian casualties. We've seen in Fallujah, uh, Mambij, other, other, um, uh, other battles that uh, when ISIS has sort of moved these convoys out of the city as soon as these areas were about to collapse, there have been some times where coalition aircraft have engaged these convoys and sometimes they have not. Now with the number of safe havens, I guess, in Iraq and Syria sort of shrinking where these guys can run to, do you anticipate a change in the rules of engagement as the battle for Mosul kind of starts off and you see more of these convoys moving out? So number one, I do not expect a change in the uh, rules of engagement. Um, I can tell you that uh, we will continue to use the very deliberate process that we have for both uh, what we call deliberate targeting um, and then those situations that require dynamic targeting, which is typically what happens uh, as you start to close in on the enemy, as you saw in Manbij and um, has happened in Fallujah and Ramadi, all the, the uh, locations that we've been able to uh, defeat Dash. So I would suspect uh, as we close in on Mosul, uh, we're going to work closely with the ground component and they're going to develop a scheme of maneuver that um, could, could put them in the same type of situation. And we will use our very deliberate uh, process where we're going to search out for and look out for civilians to ensure that uh, before we release any weapon, uh, we've done everything conceivably possible to protect those civilians ensure, and to ensure that we're going on only after uh, militarily appropriate targets. And uh, uh, we have worked through um, learning some of the lessons that we saw both Fallujah uh, and up in Mambage to uh, what I would offer to you be very precise about how we do that. Now, uh, there are occasionally, as you've read, uh, issues that we will go into great depth to investigate to determine what happened. And what I'd offer to you there is that we have uh, and not just from the air component, but in coordination with the ground component, a very robust uh, process that allows us to identify where we uh, think something happened, then take a look at it, and then run a robust uh, investigation if required to understand what happened. Okay. Uh, next we'll go to Andrew Tillman with Military Times. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, on the prospect of uh, joint operations with the Russians, can you help us understand, from your point of view, what would be the operational advantage of that? Are the Russians going to bring a capability that, that we don't have? Are they going to be providing us uh, some sort of intelligence or ISR that we can't otherwise obtain? I mean, is there really an operational advantage to this from your perspective, or is this primarily part of a, a broader uh, diplomatic process? Well, I would offer to you that that would probably be better asked um, at the diplomatic level because uh, clearly uh, from my perspective my job will be to uh, number one ensure that uh, as this moves forward uh, we're comfortable that uh, the, uh, the guidance that we get is uh, operationalized into a process that um, allows us to continue the momentum that we have against ISIL, um, build on um, the, uh, the coalition that we have put together to allow us to continue to pressure Dash. 
beyond that, with respect to uh, what the Russians might bring to this fight, um, I'm not going to speculate about that right now. I think we've got to get through these seven days and ensure that the, the regime, the Russians, do the right thing. And then we've got to work the process uh, to, uh, to see how that would uh, ultimately flesh out into an operation that would be executable. Next to Tony Capaccio with Bloomberg. Hi, sir. Uh, could you walk through the concept of operations for Mosul in terms of the air campaign? Would it mostly be CAS provided by A-10s and AC-130s? Uh, and what is the capability of the ISF now to call in close air support fairly quickly rather than going through that joint operations center? And then I had a second question. Yeah, Tony. So first off, I can tell you we're already um, – shaping the environment uh, for the uh, uh, Iraqi security forces. And by that, um, as I demonstrated, we're getting after VBID uh, factories. We're getting after command and control nodes. Um, it, although it's a little bit more strategic in nature, getting after the revenue and uh, some of these oil tankers is another way that we've been able to impact the way Dash is operating inside of Mosul. The intent there is really to shape the environment so that as uh, the ISF prepares uh, to uh, liberate Mosul, uh, we've softened up the enemy for them. And um, I think that is having great effect now. We're going to continue to do that until they're ready to execute. Um, again, it wouldn't be appropriate, I don't think, to get into the specifics of how they're going to do that, but I can tell you it's, it's uh, closely coordinated. Uh, with us so that we understand their scheme of maneuver. And so what I would tell you will happen as we get closer uh, uh, and the ISF begins to move out, it will move into that environment similar to what you saw in, in Manbij where we're doing dynamic targeting. And I'll tell you we're being very effective um, communicating with the ISF to our JTACs and our, our, our strike cells to be able to rapidly understand, number one, where the target is, where any of the closest civilians or friendly forces are, and then deliver ordnance onto that target. Uh, that's how we operated in Mandij. It's what we did in Fallujah. And we've continued to refine those tactics, techniques, and procedures uh, to a point that I think we're being very effective in a, a very timely fashion to deliver uh, precise effects on the battlefield. This chemical weapons facility that you attacked, uh, you know, we're always skeptical when we hear about chemical weapons in the Middle East. Was this a chlorine plant or, you know, sarin or what? And why the, uh, the breadth of aircraft you used? You went from Harriers to B-52s. So uh, the, uh, um, the target set, um, as we better understood it, uh, was basically a, a, a pharmaceutical element that they were uh, we believe using them for most probably chlorine, uh, chlorine or mustard gas. We're not, we don't know for sure at this point. But with respect to the number of uh, airplanes we used, so as we looked at uh, the number of uh, points of interest, uh, you know, Tony, you probably understand JDPIs. That, that's ex specifically we had a pretty significant number of them. And so to allocate um, the right types of weapons from the, the necessary number of platforms, we needed that many jets to be able to take out the, uh, the breadth of that facility that was out there on the ground. So again, um, it's a matter of looking at what the target is, determining the necessary types of weapons to achieve the effects that we wanted, and that's the, uh, the deliberate process that we use to, uh, to execute what we would call deliberate targeting. On inventories, you've dropped about 52,000 munitions since August of 2014. <clears throat> What's the state of your inventory now? Are you, uh, you know, on your last legs waiting for the cavalry to come, or do you have adequate supplies at the moment? Last legs. Come on, Tony. We're good. we got plenty of weapons. And um, I would tell you that, uh, in fact, every day I get an update on uh, some of our key munitions to make sure uh, we're tracking it. and. Um, you know, for specifics, we actually have triggers uh, that are identified to me that I then use to relay to higher headquarters for resupplies, and we share this with uh, both uh, headquarters, Air Force, and CENTCOM so that we all have a common understanding of where we're at. And when we believe, based on forecasts and operational activities, we're going to need resupplies. And 
uh, they've been uh, very proactive in, in uh, getting us what we need. Uh, next to Joe Tabbitt with Al Hura. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if you could answer my question, sir. Uh, in regards to the uh, joint integration center with Russia, do we know the location of, of, the, of the center? It's going to be in somewhere in the, in the Middle East. Could you share something, any details with us? So I think right now that is still in work. Uh, there are um, um, planning activities ongoing with respect to that. And uh, quite frankly, it would be premature to declare the specific location that it's going to happen at. Quick, quick follow-up, sir. Go back. I want to go back to your opening statement. You mentioned that you had discussions and meetings with the GCC leaders. Could you give us more details on that? Uh, yes, sir. So uh, as I arrived on station, uh, I reached out to uh, the other um, air chiefs, so the commanders of the respective air forces from each one of those nations. Number one, to introduce myself. Uh, and then number two, to get a sense of uh, how we could better cooperate, uh, get a sense of how their uh, Air Force uh, was operating, things that uh, we could do to uh, better uh, work together, uh, looking for both opportunities and understanding any challenges they might have. Uh, and, and with each one of them, it's always a, a great opportunity, quite frankly, to build an airman-to-airman -airman relationship uh, so that uh, if there's an issue, they can call me or I can do that uh, in a manner that allows us to work through problems in a, a personal manner. Next to Lucas Tomlinson with Fox News. General, do you trust the Russians? So right now, right now, the, uh, the Russians and the regime need to do the right thing. And... Um, uh, I'm not going to tell you I trust them. I think uh, we, we, we had, from our side, have to do some planning, and uh, they need to do the right thing, and we'll see what happens from there. Are you concerned that uh, if the next hospital is bombed in Syria by either the regime or the Russians, that the United States will get the blame? Well, first off, uh, the, uh, the intel community will have to, to validate that. And, um, and I'll, I'll allow the, uh, the seniors to work through, uh, number one, sorting out what the facts are and then determining who the uh, appropriate entity needs to be held accountable for that. Uh, next to uh, Louis Martinez with ABC News. Hi, General. Thank you for doing this briefing. Just have a couple of short questions. Um, could you clarify something? I know that we're talking about uh, this joint uh, center ahead of time. but. Is there going to be a division of labor where the Russians target al-Nusra and the U.S. will stick only to ISIS, or is it going to be a combination where we also will target al-Nusra? So that's that's yet to be figured out. I think again, uh, you know, we got to get through these uh, seven days of cessation of hostilities, and um, from our end, we're going to continue to prudently plan how we would. Uh, um, execute the guidance that we're given into the future. So uh, those are details that are yet to be worked out. And this is probably going to fall under that category as well, but you, you bring a, a very detailed, very rigorous uh, process for target selection uh, to minimize civilian casualties. Are you going to provide that level of detail uh, to the Russians potentially so that they can work it on their end? Well, what I'll tell you is our process won't change. We are going to continue to uh, execute with precision, ensure that as we develop targets, we fully understand them, and then when we go execute, uh, again, we'll ensure that uh, as we prosecute the wh whatever target is, we'll continue in the same manner that we execute today, which is to ensure that we clear for civilians, understand where, uh, what the target is and what its uh, military um, advantages, and uh, continue to use the same process that we have today. The uh, operation uh, that occurred on the border with Turkey, that the, where the Turks and the, the vetted uh, moderate opposition, I, I assume it was the vetted opposition that was calling in airstrike support there uh, in that operation. How did that work with how you normally uh, call in uh, airstrikes? So there were a couple different uh, situations there. Uh, and just to be clear, so the, the Turkish 
are, are you talking about the Turkish supporting their own guys on the ground or the strikes that uh, we executed in support of the, uh, the vetted uh, Syrian opposition? Uh, mainly the latter, but if you could expand on both, that would be good as well. So on the, in support of uh, the, uh, uh, the VSOs, when we executed those, um, we have uh, forces that are um, talking to and in coordination with the VSO. So we know where they're at, we have clear comms with them, and then uh, our U.S. entities that are talking to the VSO, they have what we call strike cells. And those strike cells are manned with the appropriate number of people to, again, understand where the VSO is at, where the target is at, and then they relay that to our airplane so that we can strike. Uh, again, a uh, tactic, technique, and procedure we've refined over time and, quite frankly, have been able to execute with, uh, with great precision. Uh, the Turkish, on the other hand, um, as they were operating, they were doing that um, within their own national capabilities. What I would tell you, though, is uh, we had knowledge that they were flying. We were able to deconflict with them. We actually have uh, folks that are up in their air operations center so that we have um, good connectivity with our people to work that deconfliction and uh, in fact, to give us notification that uh, they're going to be executing operations up there. So, uh, again, uh, this is uh, uh, a mechanism uh, that we've been uh, leveraging for a while now and is, is proven in most cases. It's not perfect, but in most cases to ensure that uh, we're able to have appropriate notice and then work the deconfliction. Okay, next we'll go to uh, Otto Kreischer. Good morning, General. Uh, following up on Louis' uh, question, uh, the Turk since they've gotten involved in, uh, mostly in the Syrian uh, theater, how has that affected uh, your operations? We're still flying out of uh, Insuric. You know, uh, is the Turkish operations having any, any conflict or reducing your resources available for your targeting? Thank you, sir. Uh, so early after the, uh, the coup, we, we had to work through a few challenges as uh, uh, the Turkish military regrouped. I will tell you now, we've worked through that. Uh, we have had uh, uh, no issues at all from our perspective in terms of operating out of Inserlik or out of Diyarbakir. And uh, that continues to be um, an area, though, that we will uh, obviously continue our discussions with them and make sure that uh, we have a good communications link. Um, but from the perspective of executing operations, it's had no impact on our ability to continue to pressure dash and, uh, and hammer the enemy across the battle space. Uh, next we'll go to Jim Mikulszewski with NBC News. Uh, going back to the integrated airstrikes, understanding of course that the Russians have to do the right thing. Uh, would it primarily entail deconfliction of airspace uh, or is it within the realm of possibility that U.S. and Russian warplanes would be sharing the same battle space uh, uh, over Syria. Yeah, Jim, that'll be part of the prudent planning that we have to sort out. Uh, those, those details are not sorted out at this point, and uh, I think you understand my first point. So uh, we will continue to, on our side, uh, think about those things and, and work through those as part of our planning process. You envision the possibility that Russian and American commanders would be sitting back uh, and and sharing information and directing each other's aircraft on what targets to attack when. We've got a ways to get to that point. Is uh, is uh, how I see that right now. Okay. Uh, next, we'll go to uh, Gordon Lubold with the Wall Street Journal. Uh, hi, General. I just wondered if you could uh, speak at all to these new reports that Israeli warplanes hit some artillery positions inside Syria uh, after some stray shells went into the Golan uh, Heights region. Do you know anything about that at all? Can you confirm that either way? At this point, I'm uh, tracking the initial reporting, and that's about it. Um, uh, I think uh, initial reporting is got to be fleshed out by the uh, intel community. So uh, at this point, I'd be just speculating with respect, and uh, uh, I, I frankly don't know at this point. No sense that uh, 
those warplanes might have been shot down. Do you have any sense on that right now? Uh, next to uh, Tom Bowman with National Public Radio. General, you say you execute with precision because you use precision weapons. The Russians do not. They use mostly dumb bombs. So looking forward, if you do coordinate airstrikes, how much of a problem will that be? You give them coordinates for a certain uh, target, and they may miss it because, again, they're not using precision weapons. Right, so those, those are part of the details that have to get worked out. What I will tell you is, uh, as you know, um, while, we, while precision weapons is part of it, um, I would also tell you there is the ISR on the front end to understand precisely where the target is. It's the capabilities on our airplanes uh, from the pods that we carry to, quite frankly, the coalition airmen that are executing every day that are able to take those capabilities and then leverage them to make sure we're putting the right weapon on the right target at the right time that allows us to be precise. So while precision is part of it, uh, from the actual weapon perspective, there's a whole lot more that goes into that. And uh, how the, uh, the Russians will ultimately deliver that will be uh, something that uh, will be determined in the future. Um, clearly a concern of, of everybody involved because this is all about um, protecting civilians and making sure we get at military appropriate targets. Well, you, you say these are details that have to be worked out, but it's a fact that they use dumb bombs. I'm asking you, what impact will that have in going after targets? Will you give them, quote unquote, easier targets that aren't in civilian areas? Just walk me through your, you, you do this for a living. How, how much of a problem will that be? There'll be some challenges there, and that'll be something that we'll, uh, we'll have to work out. And um, I, I acknowledge that uh, there are some physics involved with this that we're going to have to sort out uh, over the, the period of time once we get through this cessation of hostilities. Okay, uh, Phil Stewart with Reuters. I, I mean, moving away from the physics for a second, can you talk to us about the legal implications here? I mean, if you are providing uh, information, to, targeting information to the Russians and the Russians kill uh, civilians or uh, strike people that are not uh, the intended targets. What legal implications to the law of war are there? Is the United States a co-belligerent then in that attack? Well, that, you're probably getting ahead of the game, I would say, right now in terms of uh, specifically how information is going to get exchanged. The, the whole target discussion, I think, is premature at this point. Uh, and clearly there will be some authorities and legalities that we're going to need to work through to make sure everybody understands what the agreement is. Um, and th those are the types of things that we've got to work through to make sure everybody's aligned once we've gotten through these, uh, the, the seven days of uh, cessation of hostilities. And what about the classification aspects? I mean, are you giving away TTPs to the Russians? Well, we don't intend to do that, but uh, that'll be, uh, again, as you you work through the, I'll come into, I'll use the word tactical execution details that are, you know, out there into the future will be something that um, there's, there's work to be done there. And, uh, I, and I can tell you up front, we haven't sorted that out yet. Thank you. One more quick one here from uh, Thomas Watkins of uh, Agence France Press. Hello, General. Um, you've, you've, you've repeatedly gone back to saying that um, this uh, JIC is in planning stages and you haven't really been able to provide any specifics. I understand that it's all very preliminary. Um, are you saying then that the um, that when Kerry and Lavrov an announced this last week that uh, CENCOM and the Pentagon hadn't even been consulted uh, in terms of how this would actually be implemented? And can I ask you, also ask you personally as an Air Force officer how you feel about uh, potentially sharing intelligence information and flying with uh, America's longest or oldest adversary. So clearly we were, uh, and I'm not going to talk for CENTCOM, but I know that uh, this had been uh, in discussion for a while. So um, to get into the details of how much uh, had been shared, uh, clearly we were uh, thinking about it, but this is something that uh, has, uh, it becomes closer. We're, we're always aware of what our higher headquarters are, uh, are working their way through. Um, so that's something that I think um, has, you know, we work the diplomatic to military piece is always uh, something that we got to stay engaged with and something that we understand is, uh, is all part of the process as uh, our, uh, our diplomatic leaders 
uh, continue to work with our very challenging problems, uh, quite frankly, for the world. Um, and with respect to, to uh, my airman's perspective uh, going into the future, well, time will tell how this all works out. Again, um, uh, at this point, I'm very much focused on ensuring that the, the Russians, the regime, do the right thing and, and, uh, and, and take care of business to make sure that uh, civilians are getting protected here in the, in the very near future. All right, General, we're about out of time. Did you have anything else for us? No, I thank everyone for, uh, for the questions. It's, uh, it's again, a uh, very dynamic time over here in the AOR, and uh, I guess I'd, I'd remind everyone that uh, uh, the, the coalition continues to work very well together, and we're continuing to pressure Dash and, uh, and do great things in support of, uh, of what we're trying to do here in this mission. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody.